In this fragment, I want to introduce an interpretive tool originally developed by the German philologist Erich Auerbach in his 1946 book, My Mises, The Representation of Reality in Western Literature. For those interested, the early life check is a yes. In addition, Auerbach became influential for later writers of suspect value, such as Edward Said. Nevertheless, he does have some interesting observations about two tributary streams of what became the Western style of representing reality. I will introduce and explain his observations with a few of my own uh, additions and corrections in this video. The first tributary stream comes from Homer, and it might be called the Homeric or classical style. And the aim of this approach is to imitate reality by representing the phenomena of life as we perceive it in a fully externalized and visible way. Even processes of the mind and the emotions are treated as something to be fully expressed. The language of describing things is very rich and detailed in displaying for us all the phenomena of our lives and their relationships with one another. Furthermore, everything happens in a clear succession. Even if there are jumps forward or backward in time or in place, where time clearly passes without being described, it's still, it's not unlike waking up after eight hours of sleep, where you still perceive a more or less unbroken procession of conscious life. There's never a gap or a glimpse of unplumbed depths um, of anything in what we see. As an example of this style, Auerbach analyzes the revelation of Odysseus's scar in Homer's Odyssey, book 19, beginning at line 499. So let's look at this now. So Odysseus is in disguise uh, as just some old man, and he doesn't want to be revealed as who he is because the suitors who are in charge of his house would kill him, and he doesn't have any arms to defend himself yet. So he doesn't want to be recognized. His wife Penelope, who doesn't recognize him yet, instructs her a waiting woman to wash his feet and uh, he says something to her and then after these words from Odysseus the old woman took a bright bowl to wash his feet she poured in plenty of cold water and added warmer water to it Odysseus then sat down some distance from the hearth and quickly turned around towards the darkness for suddenly in his heart he was afraid that when she touched him she might see a scar he had and then the truth would be revealed. When Eurycleia began to wash her master, she recognized the scar immediately, a wound he'd suffered years ago from white tusks on a boar when he went to Parnassus, making a visit to Autolycus, his mother's splendid father, and his sons. Autolycus surpassed all others in thievery and swearing. A god himself, Hermes, had given him those skills. For him, he used to burn pleasing offerings, thighs of younger goats and lambs, so Hermes traveled with him, bringing willing gifts. This goes on to provide all the background, and all the background is presented in even more rich detail. He talks about how Odysseus went back when he became a man, uh, how he got his name, how when he uh, went back, he went hunting. They went hunting for a boar, and then what was the what was the sequence of events? Uh, how this beast jumped out, attacked him from the flank, and struck above his knee, a long gash in the flesh sliced by the creature's tusk. It did not reach the bone. Then Odysseus struck back at the boar, hitting it on its right shoulder. That long spear's glittering point went straight through. With a grunt, the beast fell in the dust, and its life force flew away. And Autolycus' son atten sons attended to the carcass. They neatly bound up brave Odysseus's wound, using a healing spell to staunch the flow of dark blood seeping from his skin. So again, everything is very precisely described, as Auerbach says, is appropriate to this, uh, this style. And then uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit. And after giving us all this backstory, the narrator goes right back to where he left off in the narrative, which was um, basically that she recognized the scar. And after telling this long digression, he goes back and says, that was the scar that old Eurycleia was grasping in her hands. She traced it out, recognized it, and dropped his foot. His leg fell in the basin and the bronze rang out. It tipped over on its side and spilled the water. All at once, joy and sorrow gripped her heart. 
Her eyes welled up with tears and her full voice was speechless. She reached up to his chin and said, okay, that is a, an example of the style as Auerbach describes it. Very precise details, everything happening without gaps in the sense that we understand logically everything that's happening. Um, we understand spatially what's happening. We understand cause and effect. It's all very clear and laid out to us. And even though there's a digression, and the di digression is interrupting the flow of events a little bit because it's interrupting right at a key moment, the emotion is very high because Odysseus, Odysseus is going to be recognized. What will happen then? And so he has a little digression to sort of build on that tension because the audience will remember, oh, wait, he's been discovered. What will happen? Oh, we're getting some backstory now. And even the backstory is very, very well described. He returns seamless, seamlessly back to his narrative. So that's what's going on. The aim of these stories is to make the existence of life as we know it clear to us, to conceal nothing. The psychology of human beings is shown in the act of memory, in the interplay and conflict of emotions within a person, the sudden rising up of an idea or a feeling. So Odysseus turned away because suddenly the thought occurred to him that, oh, she'll recognize the scar. And then we learn about what the scar is. So that's exactly what he's talking about there. Everything in the Homeric story happens in a kind of eternal present, where even if we uh, go backwards and then forwards the narrative, we always are returning to that eternal present within which the main story takes place. Now, the second tributary stream comes from the Old Testament and might be called the biblical style. The aim of this approach is to present moral, religious, and psychological phenomena. There is less concern for the horizontal connection of one story to the next. The concern is with the vertical connection between each story and God, or rather to the truth which each story aims to convey, a moral truth or a religious truth that's important to recognize. We see, for instance, uh, through the course of the Old Testament, the act of God choosing a man and forming him for his purposes. And from Adam down to the prophets, we see this process enacted. And the process often transforms the man, producing an individual character and also the phenomenon of character development. In Homer, the story is intended to reveal the character, but the character is something already complete and formed. It unfolds to us in its completeness. It's not necessary that Achilles have character growth in the Iliad, and in a way he really doesn't. You know, he gets angry and then the anger, anger comes to an end. That's not a development of character. But in the Bible, it is important because it's crucial to the lesson that we're being taught. Who the man becomes, how he changes under the influence of God is important, it's critical. David would be an example of, uh, of someone like that who has an individual character, who has character development. The psychology of human beings as presented in the biblical style is something layered and complex with conflicts between layers. Now, I'll note in passing that among the classical writers, Plato also does this. But Plato, as Nietzsche later argues, is in a sort of competition with Homer. But we'll leave that for another day and we'll return uh, to our topic at hand. So in the biblical style, the precise display of the phenomenon of life is far less important. There are many gaps. Many things are unexplained. Many things are many, merely suggested, and they're often suggested in such a way as to call for interpretation of some kind. The horizontal connection between stories and between elements of the stories will often show huge gaps. Now, as an example of this style, he looks at the Abraham and Isaac story from Genesis 22. So let's take a look at that now. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass 
and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. What Auerbach points out about this style, the story, is that the speakers, Abraham and God at the beginning, they're not in any place. God does not come like in Homer, God, uh, Zeus comes down from Olympus, or he comes from the land of the Ethiopians. He's just present. He's suddenly present. We don't know his motives for tempting Abraham. Um, in Homer, why Zeus does what he's going to do, he explains to us. But we don't know what God's motives are, and neither is Abraham much explained. Rather, he is in a moral relation to God and not a physical one. The details of the story that we are given are presented in order that the story can proceed, but not much else is given. There's very few descriptive adjectives used for either Abraham, his serving men, the wood, or the knife. They travel for three days, but we know nothing of the journey, practically inviting a symbolic interpretation. The Bible only presents as much externalization of phenomena as is absolutely necessary for narrative, and everything else is obscure. Time and place are undefined. Thoughts and feelings are unexpressed or are only suggested by silences and fragmentary speeches. So the Homeric style is the style of the foreground. Even when it goes back and forth in time, it gives the impression of everything taking place in a clear way that we can see everything in an eternal present. The Bible has foreground and background. There's perspective that we can see. God will only show part of himself. There's something unknowable and unknown there. He extends into unknown depths. The human beings have depths. Abraham's behavior includes his knowledge of God's promise to him. His silent obedience to God has its layers, but we don't know much about it. Any conflict that may take place in him about the idea of killing his son, we don't know. Clearly, there must be something going on. In Homer, it would be like, oh, and Abraham was torn in his heart because of this and that and the other. That isn't even mentioned in the, in the biblical account. It's just not part of its style. There is a problematic psychology implied that is almost unknown in the Homeric style. One interesting detail is that the Homeric poems can be falsehoods, but it it doesn't matter at all. Even, even whether the events of Homer happened or not is irrelevant to their effect, but it matters very much if the Bible stories are real and in what sense they are real. The Homeric style attempts to flatter and please the audience because it's trying to win them over and, and get them to uh, involve themselves in the fictional dream. It's kind of trying to seduce them into it. The Bible has a different approach. It demands the audience listen and subject itself. The stories invite an interpretation. God is presented as a hidden God. In Homer, the style brings us in to forget our reality for a time with a duplicate reality that is 
as externally real as our reality in some way. But in the Bible, we are brought in to overcome our reality, to see that vertical relationship to truth or to God that is critical to its lessons. Auerbach claims that the Homeric style is a style of a static world and a static society. There is a principle in the classics that each thing has its place in the hierarchy and there is a style appropriate to each place in the hierarchy. You use elevated language to describe elevated things. You use common language to describe common things. And you don't mix the styles. Like if your poem is an epic poem like Homer, you're going to stay as much as possible in the elevated style. You might include common people like Eurycleia, but she only is interesting to us in her relation to the hero who is, by the way, an aristocrat of the most elevated class. There's, there's other characters in the poem, in, in the Odyssey especially, who are also common folk, but again, they only matter in their relation to uh, the elevated uh, heroes. But if you're going to write uh, a different kind of poem, like a satire in classical tradition, then you could use common language and describe common things. It's appropriate to that kind of poem. Realism, uh, as we think of it today, is not something in the Homeric style per se, uh, meaning realism as a description of home, humdrum, everyday reality. Everything is kind of elevated in the Homeric style. But in the Bible, the conception of what is high and low is very different. So um, Auerbach con contrasts not only Homer, but like later, but also later classical writers like Petronius and Tacitus, who in those two, they do write about common people and common realistic things. But what's interesting about them is they both look down on the common world and the common things from a height. Tacitus writes from the vantage of a historian surveying the fullness of events and judging them as an educated man of the highest rank and essentially expecting us as the reader to do so as well. Petronius looks down upon people behaving badly and invites us to laugh at their behavior. He shows us the words and behavior of the common people or the nouveau riche or whatever class it is he's looking at and invites us to laugh at it. So they both do use realism in their works, but it's a kind of realism where it's viewed from on high. The Bible does not do that. And just as an example of where high and low mix, he refers to Peter's denial of Jesus. He specifically refers to the passage, to this uh, event as it's depicted in the Gospel of Mark. And let's just take a look at that for a moment because it's, it's brief and it is kind of interesting. This is a description of kind of everyday life, but it's also a sublime event. So let's take a look. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, you are one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entryway. Just then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you are a Galilean. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. This is what Auerbach refers to as a mixture of high and low styles, high and low qualities in the same context. There's many things going on in this passage. It's taking place in the context of really everyday life. It's just, it's a servant girl talking to him, right? Uh, but it's also a profoundly non-classical presentation. Just to give another example of how it's non-classical, we're never told how Peter got away. We're just told this story as just a separate story with a meaning, but like its connection to other stories, we don't know. So this mixture of high and low styles is something that starts to take, is something that takes place in the Bible and especially in early uh, Christian work. Um, Auerbach refers to the episodes of Christ's incarnation and passion as demonstrating 
the, bl the blending of the sublime and high style with the humble qualities of the low style. And this approach of blending styles was something that was confirmed uh, elsewhere in scripture. There are passages, for instance, that say that God has hidden things from the wise and prudent, but revealed them to children. And there's also the, the simple fact that Christ chose as his disciples men of humble rank. So Christ isn't picking out humble, isn't picking out aristocrats of the type that we see in Homer. He's picking out fishermen. So there's a mixture of high and low implied from the very beginning. Now, Auerbach observes that as the biblical stories move away from the tradition in which they were born, in other words, the Jewish tradition, they require more explanation and connection. It becomes almost unsustainable to just talk about or interpret the stories um, in the original style, in that vertical, biblical, Old Testament style. There is increasingly a demand to connect things horizontally as well. There's an enormous pressure, in other words, to start to blend the two styles together. The two tributary streams start to run together. And Arbach looks at the course of this over several centuries of European literature, but the real great artistic hero in his book is Dante, because it's in Dante that the two streams come together for the first time with enormous success, just undeniable artistic success. It seems that the earlier attempts to blend the streams lacked either the mastery of language or the subtlety of thought necessary to truly combine them. Now, Auerbach himself does not specifically argue this, but the implication, and I bring this to how I read literature as well, the implication is that in Dante and after, we are shown that the Christian artist must be in some sense more complex than the classical or the traditional Jewish authors. So part of the Western tradition is a natural becomes a natural complexity. Dante and Shakespeare are more complex geniuses than Homer was. That doesn't necessarily mean they're better geniuses, just that the nature of their genius is such that it will be something composite rather than a whole. It's necessarily so because these two styles come from different, have different origins, different goals, and different things they do well and they need to be blended. And I think you'll see, if you look at literature, and not just literature, but any sort of work of uh, at least narrative art in the West, there is this blending of styles visible. So this is that's why I refer to this as an interpretive or analytical tool. You can sort of analyze works according to how they combine these styles. You can sort of identify those writers who show more of a classical or neoclassical preference and those who show, show more of a biblical uh, preference. Uh, and let's return to the case of Dante. In Dante, the two styles had to be mastered and then deployed as appropriate. So in his work, we see both the seamless narrative and precise description of reality that we saw in Homer, but we also see that vertical connection to truth, that figural description of things you know, that we saw in the Old Testament. Dante's characters act in a world that is precisely described and made present to us, but they are also three-dimensional characters in ways that are somewhat foreign to the Homeric world. So the example passage for all of this is Dante the Pilgrim's encounter with Farinata, which takes place in Inferno, Canto 10. So let's take a look at that now. O Tuscan, thou who through the city of fire alive art passing so discreet of speech. Here, please thee, stay a while. Thy utterance declares the place of thy nativity to be that noble land with which perchance I too severely dealt. Sudden that sound forth issued from a vault, whereat in fear I somewhat closer to my leader's side approaching. He thus spake, What dost thou? Turn. Lo, Farinata there, who hath himself uplifted, from his girdle upwards all exposed beholden. On his face was mine already fixed. His breast and forehead there erecting seemed as in high scorn he held even hell. Between the sepulchres, 
To him my guide thrust me with fearless hand and prompt. This warning added, See thy words be clear. He, soon as there I stood at the tomb's foot, eyed me a space, then in disdainful mood addressed me. Say, what ancestors were thine? I, willing to obey him, straight revealed the whole, nor kept back aught, whence he, his brow somewhat uplifting, cried, Fiercely were they adverse to me, my party, and the blood from whence I sprang. Twice, therefore, I abroad scattered them. Though driven out, yet they each time from all parts, answered I, returned, an art which yours have shown they are not skilled to learn. So may thy lineage find at last repose, I thus adjured him, as thou solved this knot, which now involves my mind. If right I hear, ye seem to view beforehand that which time leads with him, of the present uninformed. We view as one who hath an evil sight, he answered, plainly objects far remote, so much of his large splendor yet imparts the almighty ruler. But when they approach or actually exist, our intellect then wholly fails, nor of your human state, except what others bring us, know we aught. Hence, therefore, mayst thou understand that all our knowledge in that instant shall expire, when on futurity the portals close. So this is an example of that blending of uh, style. So uh, we see the very precise description of the people, how they appear, how they act, what they think, how they feel. And yet there's also hints of depth, the man standing as if in disdain of hell. These characters who appear, they're appearing in the sepulchers of um, the, uh, the atheists and the, uh, the, the heretics. So we know that what we're seeing is also representative of a type of person. And I would suggest that going forward, just to indicate some of the utility of thinking about these two styles, you can see the blending of the styles in the way we choose to imitate reality even now. I'll take as a couple of examples two movies which were made within just a few years of one another, which show the operation of these styles even today. You might think of an action movie as something that is typically closer to the Homeric in style. It's something meant to, as Auerbach said, to please and flatter the viewer, to get the viewer into uh, 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 watching it and getting involved, caught up in the, in the fiction. But there's also an implied lower quality to this style, I think, uh, in modern terms, which is interesting. And an example would be a movie like Predator, where much of the filmmaking in that movie is devoted to letting you see precisely what is happening, how the action unfolds. There's very little psychological depth to anything that is presented there. Everything is presented as happening in a kind of, if you will, eternal present without much background. The alien enemy in the film is revealed to be a hunter of some sort, and this is enough. It's so all we kind of need to know. But for a movie that shows the operation of the other style, you might think of something like Silence of the Lambs, the psychological thriller. Here in this movie, really the whole genius of this film is how much it hints at unknown psychological depths to its characters. There's about as much known uh, about uh, Dr. Lecter in that movie. Dr. Lecter in Silence of the Lambs has, a, has about as much screen time as God does in the Abraham and Isaac story, and yet he kind of dominates that story just as God does the Abraham and Isaac story. Most of what we know about him is just hinted at. There's a sense of conflicting layers to his psychology. We see intelligence, insight and culture. He's a cultivated person, but he's also violent and a psychopath. So these conflicting layers of his character are part of the are part of what people find interesting, part of what people like in the film. And you see the same thing in the main character. Uh, so Clarice also has her multiple conf conflicting layers, uh, the country upbringing that she tries to overcome the unexpressed desires to make her way in the FBI, to impress the boss, and so on. Even the motivations of Buffalo Bill have a certain unknown depth to them as well. So 
these two films show how you can even look at even look today at how um, people are can sort of fall closer to one or other of these tributary styles. And I would say that nothing is entirely to one side or the other, but I do find it interesting that there does seem to be there does seem to be a general perception that film is of lower quality the closer it gets to the Homeric style rather than the biblical because one there tends to be a sense of it becomes closer to quote pure entertainment whereas the other style is seen as something more challenging and I'll, all this by way of setting up what's going to be my next guide so uh, my next reading guide is actually going to be a guide to reading the work of Dante. And I hope to see you in the next video.